the Abagana ambush. On March 25, 1968, the second division of the Nigerian army finally broke through the Biafran resistance and entered Onitsha. The federal troops had failed the first attempt to cross the Niger, suffering great casualties at the hands of Achuse's guerrilla army. This was the second attempt. Their plan following this development was to link up these federal troops with the forces of the 1st Division led by Colonel Shua that were penetrating the Igbo heartland from the north. The amalgamation of these two forces the Nigerian army hoped would then serve as a formidable force that would smash the Biafrans. Colonel Motala Mohammed hastily deployed a convoy of 96 vehicles and four armored cars to facilitate this plan on March 31st, 1968. Biafran intelligence was swift to respond and it informed Major Jonathan Uchendo, who formulated an elaborate plan. He arranged a 700-man strong counter-attack that essentially sealed off the Abagna Road. He commanded his troops to lie in ambush in the forest near Abagana, waiting patiently for the advancing Nigerians and their reinforcements. Major Uchendo's strategy proved to be highly successful. His troops destroyed Mohammed's entire convoy within one and a half hours. All told, the Nigerians suffered about 500 casualties. There was minimal loss of life on the Biafran side. Very few federal soldiers survived this ambush, and those who did were found walking dazed and aimless in the bush. There were widespread reports of atrocities perpetrated by angry Igbo villagers who captured these wandering soldiers. One particularly harrowing report claimed that a mob of villagers cut their capture into pieces. I was an eyewitness to one such angry blood frenzy of retaliation after a particularly tall and lanky soldier, clearly a mercenary from Chad or Mali, wandered into an ambush of young men with machets. His lifeless body was found mutilated on the roadside in a matter of seconds. Gifts of poisoned water filled calabashes were left in strategic places throughout the deserted villages to welcome the thirsty federal troops. My elder sister's family took refuge in Ennobi during all this commotion, the town where I was born. My father had settled there as a catechist and a teacher half a century earlier. The host of my sister and her family began to tell them that it was from my father that the people of that village learned to eat rice about 50 years before his children returned to this bucolic town as refugees. The host, a man of great consideration and taste, proclaimed that he was therefore going to cook rice for my sister's family to salute my father. There were attempts to humanize our existence despite the horrors that surrounded us all. Life went on as much as the people could manage it. Through it all, there was a great deal of humor. I remember one occasion after an air raid, and these are really horrible things, somebody saw two vultures flying very high up and he said, that is a fighter and a bomber and everybody burst into laughter. It was a very poor joke, I know, but laughter helped everyone there keep their sanity. That is, if you wanted to survive. I did not realize how I was being affected by living under those circumstances until I traveled out of Biafra on a mission to England. I heard planes taking off and landing at Heathrow Airport and my first instinct was to duck under safe cover. Air Raid It comes so quickly, the bird of death, from evil forest of Soviet technology. A man crossing the road to greet a friend is much too slow. His friend cuts in halves, has other worries now than a friendly handshake at noon.
the Citadel Press. News filtered in that life approached some semblance of normalcy far away from the immediate arenas of war. A few weeks after my arrival in Ogidi, I was informed that there was a job opening in Enugu. So I packed up my family at my father's house and headed further east into Yuboland, and we hoped away from the war zone. Christopher Oki left his work at Cambridge University Press in Ibadan, where he served as Cambridge's West African manager. He suddenly appeared in Enugu a few weeks after I arrived from Lagos. By the time we all arrived back to eastern Nigeria, after escaping the massacres across the rest of the country, it became clear to me that it would be beneficial to the cause of Biafra if intellectuals worked together to support the war efforts. Christopher came to me and requested that we establish a publishing house. It immediately seemed to me to be a very good idea, for we believed it was necessary at this time to publish books, especially children's books, that would have relevance to our society. This was something we felt very strongly about. We felt we wanted to develop literature for children based on local thoughts, and we set up a firm called the Citadel Press. BFR declared its independence while we were developing our plans, and we were more confident than ever that what we were doing was good for the cause. Christopher proceeded to get a plot of land in a key area of Enugu off one of the city's major thoroughfares, today's Michael Okbara Avenue. It was a very strategic piece of land at the commercial nerve center of the future capital of Biafra, Enugu. The building that was erected had a few rooms, one for Christopher, one for me, one for our secretary, one area for printing and publishing machinery, and a smaller one was a toilet. Christopher made all the arrangements himself, that was his nature. He would get the work done before even broaching the subject, so that when you eventually agreed to his idea, something he was sure you would, he would then release a torrent of information in this case about the office location, its design, and what the building would cost us. The first book we worked on was called How the Leopard Got Its Claws. John Iraganachi, a talented author, submitted a manuscript of a version of the African myth How the Dog Became a Domesticated Animal, which Professor Ernest Emeniano relates abounds in various versions in many African cultures. Christopher and I realized immediately that we wanted a different story, more or less, and decided to spend some time on it. Iraganachi's story transformed into something entirely different as I walked on it and began to take and find avenues and openings in a way that the original narrative hadn't. Christopher, in particular, was put up by the subservient character of the dog in the original version and was delighted to see the next incarnation of the story. To be certain that everyone was on the same page, Christopher asked Iraganachi if he was ready to see his original story transformed. Iraganachi had no problem with the changes we had suggested and we settled on a joint authorship for our first book between me, John Iraganachi, and Okibo, who wrote a powerful poem, Lament of the Day, on my invitation. Christopher was seen less often as the war intensified. I kept on working at the office and he came back whenever he had some time and we discussed a number of matters. The war clearly influenced the crafting of the new story. In the second version, the leopard is the king of animals and is a peaceful and wise king. One day, he is cast out by tyrants led by the dog into the cold world's wilderness. The leopard seeks help from the blacksmith who makes teeth and claws of steel for him, thunder and lightning, that grants him his raw and strength. Then he returns to his kingdom to retake his throne, punish the usurpers, and banish the dog to the service of man in perpetuity. 
In the end, the new story not only turned the ancient African fable on its head, but also clearly had manifestations of the Biafran story embedded in it.